Right now, currently, I live in Pensacola, New Jersey. Um, married to a wonderful gentleman, Aaron. Um, unfortunately, our first wedding anniversary, I was here at the hospital in the coma. The first wedding anniversary <laughs> occurred when he was in, in on ECMO, my coma. <laughs> in his coma. And so Aaron made a miniature of their wedding cake and brought it in for the staff. So we all ate the same, their wedding cake on yes. their anniversary. Yes. <laughs> Back at the end of August, I was having a difficult time breathing. So I was positive I had COVID. Aaron had come home, it was like two o'clock in the morning from work, and he was supposed to stay at a hotel that night because we were having work done on the house. And he said something told him to, you know, just check on me. And he came in and I was on the floor, passed out. Dr. Green, after speaking with him, said that had he not come home um, that night, I would, have pa I would have passed on the floor. That my breathing was, you know, getting so bad because my lungs were uh, deteriorating. Uh, seven weeks later, I woke up and realized what was going on. I was told by all the staff what a beautifully decorated ICU room I had. Um, Aaron just went over the top. Uh, when I first woke up, I couldn't move a finger, not nothing. Um, from the neck down, I was just no good. And I remember saying to my husband, you know, why'd you let me live? And he said, because the doctors assured him that I would bounce back, that I would be okay. With, with knowing that, um, it was just a very gradual, you know, um, being able to move my hands, being able to move my foot, um, and I made it a, a promise. It was the beginning of November. I wanted to be home for Thanksgiving, and I said I'll work my tail off to do it, and I got discharged the day before Thanksgiving. So that was the best holiday gift I could ever get. The, the way the ICU teams work is there's a handful of ICU doctors at Cooper any any given time and they're usually broken up by location. So I was in the main ICU service that happened to have um, all of the ECMO patients on it um, and we had an open bed and uh, he wasn't on ECMO yet but we had an open bed and he was very sick and so one of the members, of, one of the fellows who was taking care of him downstairs in the emergency room said um, I have someone who's really sick, he needs to come up here now. So he kind of facilitated the transfer, he came up into the room, I still remember the room, and uh, um, and that's, and so I inherited him and he was, he was gonna be on my team for the rest of the week. So, uh, <laughs> it, it was in the days of everything was COVID, right? <laughs> so if you didn't have COVID, we, we still thought you probably had COVID. And that's all we were seeing, and he came up, he was PCR swab negative, I think as an outpatient, mm -hmm. and then again for us. And so that's when we started looking for other diagnoses. And so one of the things we do is send cultures of the sputum to see if there's another pneumonia or in Legionella, it's actually a urine test we send. And when it came back positive, it took a day or so, then we knew for sure that that was the diagnosis. Legionella is a bacteria um, and it causes one of the atypical pneumonias is what we call it. And I would say, you know, the reports vary, but probably five to 10% of all bacterial pneumonias are from Legionella. Now I think higher percentage of that um, exists in the ICU because there's groups of patients who tend to get very sick when they get Legionella. So those would be patients over 50 or with prior lung disease like COPD or have some sort of immunocompromised state. When I woke up and Aaron said to me, you know, you have Legionnaire's disease, I was like, what? I thought that was something back in the 70s. And he's like, no, he goes, that's what you got. You know? And I'm like, wow, what's the chances of that? And he says, oh, and by the way, you got leukemia too. I was like, a double whammy. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? He said, no. So um, Stephen has something called hairy cell leukemia. So when you hear leukemia, you think of ALL or AML, you think of some really bad diagnosis. Hairy cell leukemia itself is um, usually curable and sometimes doesn't require treatment at all. And so um, it sounds like a big bad diagnosis, but in reality, 
um, it's probably rather minor. So we got the diagnosis. We had decided to put him on ECMO. We were going to do it. Our oncology colleagues were involved in taking care of him. And they, they, they came, I will never forget, they told us as we were putting the cannulas in for ECMO that he had leukemia. Um, and it was just like, you know, we don't feel the same way you did, but it kind of felt like to us, like, oh, another diagnosis, another thing we have to, we have to take care of. But it was kind of put on the back burner. He got over his pneumonia, it got off ECMO, got better, and then they addressed it. So I think it's important. Let's talk just a little bit about ECMO and what it is, because um, I think there's some misunderstanding. So, so ECMO doesn't treat the disease. It doesn't fix the pneumonia, you know, and and doesn't fix ARDS, which is the syndrome that's associated with the pneumonia, acute respiratory distress, distress syndrome. What ECMO does is it says it's an artificial lung that's outside the body and blood is pumped out of your body through the artificial lung and then back into your body and it allows the lungs to completely rest. So when the lungs rest, the inflammation goes down, we can actually treat the pneumonia and gives us time to treat the pneumonia and get rid of that. And so ECMO doesn't, doesn't cure anything, it just gives us more time to let the body recover. And so what happens is as you are, your lungs are getting better and stronger, we need less and less support from the ECMO machine, eventually to a point where the ECMO machine isn't doing anything and the lungs and the ventilator are doing everything. And then when you can do that, we take you off that ECMO. Um, so that's how that kind of system how that works. As upset as I was about being discharged from that first hospital that I went to um, without any testing, it was a blessing in disguise because I know over there did not have the team that Cooper has. Hello, this is for Dr. Green and the entire staff in the ICU department at Cooper Hospital just saying thank you for all your hard work and your determination to bring me back to health and to make my story a success. Thank you. Thank you. We love you.